Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation to give these lectures. It's a great pleasure to be back at the uh, HES. Um, and thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, so, yes, so the title of this series of lectures is on the local Langlands. correspondence for reductive groups over periodic fields. <coughs> and so maybe I'll start with some kind of general introduction to the whole series. So I guess throughout the course Uh, the field QP will be fixed. In particular, there's a fixed prime P somewhere. And, and say, at least in the second half, uh, there will be a reductive group G over QP. You can already fix it now, but it won't appear until next week. Um, uh, so I will... <coughs> So let me say that everything I will do actually works for a general local non acumenian field. So for a general local non acumenian field. E. Um, I will just specialize to the case of QP to have one variable less. You know? um, and I mean, also in case E is an extension of QP and G is over E, uh, this also reduces to the previous case. Uh, by considering uh, uh, the very restriction of scalars. So in this sense, it's not even. <coughs> really a uh, uh, restriction, except that I could also consider uh, characteristic p-local fields. Uh, so. But if E is actually of characteristic p, what I'm doing is at least should be very closely related to this work in progress of uh, T and Vincent Lafork, uh, who also d um, well, do something very similar. So. <coughs> so in this sense, uh, I'll just restrict to QP. Okay, so the goal of the course is the following. It is to construct a map <coughs> from uh, irreducible smooth representations. And let's say <coughs> they evaluate in QL bar of this periodic group uh, up to isomorphism. Uh, where, of course, L is not equal to P. So to any such uh, irreducible smooth representation, the local Langlands conjecture would predict that there is an L parameter, and the goal is to construct such an L parameter. So to construct a continuous semi-simple map, and uh, where parameters are maps from the where group, uh, L parameters are maps from the where group of QP to the L group of G in this case.
and I will denote this map by pi maps to phi pi. Okay, so I mean, of course. I mean, this should be all parameters. So, in particular, they should commute with the projection to the veil group. <coughs> um, so, I guess this goes some way. Uh, towards the local language correspondence. <laughs> hmm? Sorry, what? I mean, I wanted to say that it commutes with. It's is this map? No, it's a map between the two Is that the identity? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, towards local language correspondence. Uh, but with the following caveats. Mm, so there's a whole number of them. <coughs> so one is that uh, whatever we're getting here is uh, only a semi-simple uh, uh, object. And in particular, the monotony operator is necessarily trivial. And so this procedure will not give us uh, the monotony operator n. So we do not get a veiled lean representation, we just get a veil representation. <coughs> uh, secondly, I fixed somewhere here prime L, and <coughs> uh, both the category of irreducible smooth QL bar representations and of such continuous same or simple maps here, because of some incompatibility between the topology here and here, uh, these things are actually independent of L. But it's not clear that the map is independent of L. So this may depend on L. Um, also, uh, it's just a map, and we can, uh, so far, I'm not able to say anything about the fibers of this map. So. So you would expect that at least if the group is quasi-split, then uh, the map is surjective, <coughs> and the fibers uh, have some internal description related to the centralizer group of, of this parameter phi. I don't know whether it's surjective. But for GLN, it should be what uh, For GLN, it is what, uh, what's known, yeah, by Harris, Taylor, and Young. Um, and, but I mean, other than GLN, I think it's not so clear. So I mean, it's not clear how this related to other correspondences. Uh, so say there's a work of Arthur for classical groups. using the endoscopic transfer relations. Um, <coughs> and then for not too ramified groups, there's work of De Barker and Reeder and Kaleta for not too ramified representations. <coughs> and maybe there. Others who have worked on this. I mean, so far you could map all elements to just <laughs> one. <right>? <laughs> Good <laughs> point, right? So yeah, I could map everything to. Uh, to make it dependent of L, and maybe I can one for one L. And yeah, yeah, right. I mean. <laughs> um, right? So, I mean, so this is pretty stupid so far. Um, <coughs> I mean, one can prove some things, and I mean, in particular, one can 
say a few things about the compatibility with the cohomology of some reporting spaces and generalizations of this, um, which um, gives some control. In particular, for GLN, you can prove that it agrees with what you think it should be. Um, but I mean, it is a valid comment. It's a there's still a lot to be done yeah? until. Uh, is it functorial in some sense? I mean, it's not clear what. I mean, to, to ask whether it's functorial, you would first of all need an independent automorphic functoriality, right? No, I mean, if you have H mapping to G, can you relate the. Well, but I mean, do you have a map on L parameters then if you have a map of L groups, but you don't a priori have a map on the representations if you don't have an up independent construction of functoriality. Uh. <coughs> For example, with the center or things? Uh, um, so I think you should be able to identify the central character and you should be able to prove compatibility with twisting and uh, parabolic induction, things like this. Yeah. <coughs> but, right. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I will want to start with a brief outline uh, of how the construction is supposed to go to get some motivation for uh, a lot of technical stuff this week. Um, and and ramification. Uh, in which generality do you have unramified base change? What you QP to some uh, unramified extension? Which, in which case do you, do you know that this exists? I mean you, have, you take a, your E is unramified extension. But do you always know that you can do unramified base change on the automorphic side? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But geometrically, maybe. It's um. Hmm. <laughs> do you think? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Laurent says it's okay. <laughs> um. Okay, so <coughs> let me give some brief outline of the construction. So <coughs> Um, for some reason, I want to work with torsion coefficients, as it's usually easier in the Sital theory. So let's say my coefficient ring uh, will be some O mod L to the N O, where O over the L is a finite extension, finite normal uh, extension. So. Um, so the crux of the matter will actually be to be to define <coughs> a certain category of something like constructible sheaves on FARC uh, on the stack of G bundles on the five one ten curve. But actually you have to be careful with the constructability notion. And so instead there will be a slightly different condition called reflexive. Of reflexive sheaves um, on the stack of G bundles on the far content. Um, so reflexive, this just means that F maps isomorphically to the double VRD dual. <coughs> so this is something that's usually satisfied for constructible sheaves and is clearly a kind of finiteness condition. 
and turns out to be exactly the kind, right kind of finiteness condition <coughs> that does what you want uh, in this situation. So why do we care about Bungie here? Uh, <coughs> The stack of G bundles on the Fark von Ten curve has this funny property that <coughs> the automorphism of the trivial G bundle is not uh, the algebraic group G. as would usually be the case on usual smooth projective curves. Uh, but instead, as a periodic group, G of QP. And so this means, or one can show that there actually is an open Im uh, immersion of like the classifying stack for this periodic group G of QP uh, as an open substack of the stack of G bundles. And so this means that <coughs> if I consider sheaves on Bungie, then if I restrict them to this open substack, then they will precisely correspond to uh, uh, representations of this periodic group. So F is a sheaf on Bungie. Uh, and this will actually correspond automatically by the formalism to a smooth representation of G of Q. <coughs> <coughs> and okay, so in this way we want to <coughs> embed this representation theory of the periodic group somewhere into the theory of sheaves on the stack of G bundles. Um, but we see that if you want to do this, uh, we necessarily have to consider sheaves with infinite dimensional stalks because these smooth representations here, they are usually infinite dimensional. <coughs> and so we need some kind of constructibility notion for these sheaves on Bungie, which takes into account infinite dimensional stalks. But it turns out that you can do this. And <coughs> so the three key ingredients then will be the following. Uh, <coughs> the first is a classification result for these reflexive sheaves. So this will be this reflexivity condition, which is I mean, this purely abstract definition that you can just easily write down, turns out to be related uh, to the admissibility condition on the representation. So it corresponds to admissible representations. Second thing is that <coughs> what was some of Fark's idea is that if you want to study the local language correspondence, uh, you can try to do it by doing some kind of geometric language correspondence on the stack of G bundles. And so we have this a suitable category of constructible sheaves now. And then we want to show <coughs> that the hacker operators preserve this category. So we need to show that uh, 
by one you mean that the, they are determined by their restriction to the open source? Uh, no. Um, <coughs> so in general, this has a countable number of points uh, given by this Kotwitz set P of G, and whenever you restrict to one of these points, um, you automatically get a smooth representation of this group JB, and what you ask is that this is always an admissible representation. Uh, the second thing you need is that reflexive sheaves are stable under Hecker correspondences. Under Hecker operators. All right, so there is a picture that you maybe have some Hecker stack, some mu. times the curve. <coughs> you have two projections. <coughs> and you want that if you take P2 lower shriek of P2 one upper star, that this gives you a functor from D reflexive. And I mean, related to the second, you actually need a <coughs> classification of hack operators in the usual geometric Satake way. So if you want, need that hack operators correspond via some version of geometric Satake. Representations of the L group. So let me now briefly proceed, assuming that uh, we had this kind of formalism set up, how one would, how would one go about uh, defining this alpha meter here. So uh, the strategy is to define uh, what Vincent Lafour calls basically calls excursion operators. <coughs> so, uh, You can do the following. So whenever you have representations of the L group, uh, you get a functor, which is some, uh, the heck operator for all these guys, which will go from the category of reflexive sheaves on Bungie uh, towards itself. Uh, but actually, <coughs> um, if you apply hack operator, there's an extra copy of the curve on the target. And the way this works out is that uh, after you apply hack operator, you actually get a wave group action on the sheaf. And so actually, uh, if you apply n-hack operators, which is some of the composite of them, uh, you actually get n commuting value group representations. And so formalism works in such a way that if you restrict uh, to the diagonal action, restrict to diagonal action. And this is also the same thing as the heck operator for the tensor product 
up these representations. <coughs> And so uh, the other data that you have when you try to define excursion operators are the following. You have a map from the trivial representation to the tensor product. <coughs> and you have a map from the tensor product back to the trivial representation. And you have elements, say, tau 1 up to tau n in the Weyl group. Then you get the following endomorphism. of any sheaf f, any reflexive sheaf. <coughs> so via alpha, so, uh, so for the trivial representation, uh, this heck operator is just the identity. <coughs> and so in particular, uh, this map alpha will give you a map from f into the guy for the tensor product. <coughs> but this is the same thing as the operator for this tuple of representations. But if I have such a tuple of representations, I can, <coughs> I have these commuting Weyl group actions. And I can apply these elements and go back to itself. <coughs> which then again is just the heck operator for the tensor product. <coughs> and then via beta, I can go back to f. Somewhere this is... All right, so, <coughs> so this formalism tells us that <coughs> we can produce a lot of non-trivial endomorphisms of our sheaf. Uh, and so uh, if f is irreducible, uh, then these are scalars. <coughs> and a lemma of Vincent Lafogue and okay, so and also they satisfy a bunch of compatibility equations. So what is irreducible? Is it like irreducible perverse shift, irreducible shift? Is it an option of the right category? I think, let's say it's, uh, it sits in the usual t-structure and is irreducible. Um, so then. <coughs> the lemma of Vincent Lafogue essentially tells you that these scalars determine a unique continuous same as simple. I've written the phi for f. And I guess in this step, I'm implicitly also somehow passing from my lambda to QL bar in some limit procedure. I mean, if I have these scalars for all such lambdas, then I can go to an inverse limit and then get 
all elic numbers. <coughs> and so if you apply this uh, to a sheaf of the form, the extension by zero of a sheaf for some pi, where pi is an irreducible smooth representation, in particular admissible, And J was this inclusion from the point mod G of QP into bond G. Uh, we get this phi pi. I mean, maybe I should also say what this, uh, the relation is between this. Uh, so whenever you have an L parameter, you can also produce a scalar out of the same data. Namely, <coughs> uh, you have a map from, uh, what do I have to say this? <coughs> If you have an L parameter, then you have a map into the L group, and if you have a representation of the L group, you can compose it with this. So this is some representation of the big QP. <coughs> so this is a representation of n copies of uh, <coughs> the Weyer group. And so then you can also via uh, alpha, you can <coughs> embed it into there, and then again you can apply these elements to 1 to 2n to go to itself. Uh, sorry, yeah. yeah. And then via beta you can go back to QL bar. Does this n have anything to do with f? No, you do this for all possible n. But why do you do need to do this? Uh, because otherwise, if you just have one representation, I mean, there's not so much interesting data if you just have one representation. That's because <coughs> to recover the representation category of GL. Right. I mean, basically, you want to say that uh, if you look at and if you want to construct this continuous same or simple L parameter, you somehow have to know all the simultaneous conjugacy classes of elements. And then <coughs> these are determined by certain rational functions on some simultaneous orbit space. And then what Vincent Lafogue proves is that the functions, <coughs> and from this kind of data, you can produce functions on these kind of simultaneous orbit spaces and they generate uh, this algebra. If you have a classical group, for example, Mm -hmm. You need less representation? Uh, if you have a classical group, you probably need fewer representations, but I'm not exactly sure how this works. Yeah. I mean, for a GLN, I guess you only need two, right? And you basically take the standard 10 to the standard duals, and you have a natural maps into and out of it. And then for any two elements, you get something. <coughs> and I think this basically gives you the trace of... Uh, oh, yeah, it's a trace of the representation. <coughs> what happens for the other strata of Bungie? Right, I mean, then you also get. Right, then this formalism applies as well, and you get some L parameter there. But, I mean, all the groups you're getting, there are some kind of inner forms of Levy's, at least if the group is quasi split. And then the alpha meter you should get is just, uh, well, inner forms, they don't really care mm -hmm. about the L group. And then you can just embed the L group of the levy into 
Ja, weg eigentlich. <coughs> Then of course there's, there's a question whether <coughs> some kind of compatibility with parabolic induction question there. But which one can address, I think. Okay, so uh, so to make this work, we need solid foundations. on the Tau cohomology of the intervening objects. <coughs> and so, oh. in particular, we need some kind of proper base change, smooth base change, concrete duality. Stuff like that. And so uh, I didn't really say what kind of geometric object this bungee is so far, so <coughs> so on the setting of the Fark von Ten curve, this bungee was Usually, on this usual smooth projective curves, this would be some smooth Altian stack. Um, in this Fark von Ten case, this turns out to be a stack on the category of perfectoid spaces. So <coughs> so it turns out that you can always define some kind of relative Fark von Ten curve when you have a perfectoid space of characteristic P. And well, then these are your test objects, and then some kind of stack on this category. And so, so usually we have this diagram. So we have schemes, and then these are maybe generalized to algebraic spaces. Which we can then further generalize to Artian stacks. <coughs> and we will need a variant of this picture uh, where we have perfected spaces of characteristic P uh, which sit fully faithfully in some category of so-called diamonds. So they are the analog of algebraic spaces in this world. <coughs> and then there are some kind of good stacks, stacks like Bungie, uh, which admit some kind of smooth cover by a diamond. Uh, um, <coughs> and so actually, for the most part, you need to develop some formalism on this, on this category here. Extending to stacks is then rather formal by some kind of smooth descent and so on and so forth. And still technical, but okay, so the main thrust is here. So, so first week uh, will be about the talk homology of diamonds.
but in, in, a, first, in a algebraic geometry, classical mm. one, uh, most of the stacks, acting stacks, which, which are recurring, mm -hmm. you don't need really algebraic spaces. Uh, because you have projectivity, you have some... Uh, right. Uh, so in the, in the usual case, the difference between schemes and algebraic spaces is not too big. Uh, whereas for us, the difference between these uh, perfected space and diamonds will be really big. And so, in particular, there are sent like the usual kind of smooth spa uh, spaces like the A1 over QP or something like this. If you would like to consider this uh, in this world, it would really just be a diamond, not a perfectoid space, because it only has this perfectoid, huge perfectoid cover. And so, uh, for us, it's more critical to really work directly with diamonds. The difference is, so here there's a small difference. Oops. And here there's a really big difference. Okay, so diamonds are certain technical objects. Um, let me try to give some motivation for why one would consider these technical objects. I will define. I guess there will be a break, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, from when to when? It's 13, okay. Yeah. So after the break, I will define diamonds. Um, let me try to give some motivation first. Uh, so. <coughs> So in Pierre de Koch theory, uh, so one wants to study, say, some some smooth rigid space, like I don't know. Maybe the torus over, over CP. So let me just give you what the classical points are. <coughs> uh, a set of CP point, points of absolute value one. Um, and what one often does is. By looking at <coughs> uh, the following kind of tower, uh, always sending x to x to the p. So these are some finite tile covers of degree p. Then the limit, you maybe get something called T infinity on the CP. Yeah. So there's a word missing in the sentence. The PA theory one wants to study. Uh, does this? Uh, sorry. Um, Okay, so by con looking at this tower, so and so in this inverse limit, uh, this inverse limit will be what's called a perfectoid space. Because you've now extracted lots of p power roots of the coordinate. <coughs> and then, recovering uh, the guy, the smooth rigid space as a quotient of this by some zp action. So, so if I project this down to t of zp, <coughs> then this is some zp cover. <coughs> in 
And so it's a quotient by perfectoids of perfectoid space by some profinite group action. So this will be the kind of general thing that an diamond will be. It will be a quotient of a perfectoid space by some proital equivalence relation. So that's one setting in which someone more or less naturally comes up. <coughs> uh, another thing where this came up is in the context of, of so-called banach kolmes spaces. <coughs> so, uh, in P.A. Koch theory again, there's this uh, Fontaine's ring <coughs> Bideron plus, which is a complete DVR to residue field. CP. And <coughs> so, in particular, if you consider it modulo the second power of the maximal ideal, And what one would like to do is one would like to consider this as, an, as a geometric object which sits in a exact sequence where both of these are A1s. So, <coughs> so one would like to geometrize this. Uh, A short exact sequence in the A1 over CP to some object X again to the A1 over CP. If you get uh, for P different P's, so you will get two different perfect spaces or for a different P's. Sorry. Ah, uh, no, I mean the P is the same P as. In the base. Oh, at the Sorry. limit. Uh, mm. So if you vary the piece, so what do you get? If you vary the piece, there is a fixed p. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, you could also take further inverse limits of, for, for other primes and then get a bigger cover of, say, Galois group Z hat, and then you could also write this as some bigger guy, module the action of Z hat. Um, but uh, assuming such an object exists, some, uh, whatever category it lives in, some of us should be able to say what the something valued points are if something is a kind of geometric object that this X is in particular. Um, but, uh, but there's this ring like beta round plus mod fill 2 can only be defined uh, for perfectoid CP algebras. So this means that the only thing that this X could be is that uh, X is some sheaf on the category of perfectoid spaces over CP. But it's not itself a perfectoid space because the A1s, for example, are not. So, uh, 
But again, you can write it as a quotient x itself is not perfectoid. But uh, it can be written as a quotient. of a perfectoid space by some. Proital equivalence relation. <coughs> okay, so these are the kinds of examples that make you think that maybe one should try to study these kinds of objects that can be written as a quotient of a perfectoid space by a protal equivalence relation in some generality. And <coughs> some kind of pleasant surprise in this picture is that you can also make sense of uh, uh, if one sets up the theory correctly, and can also make sense of some objects that didn't have any meaning before uh, in this world. Uh, something like spec QP times spec QP <coughs> over some deeper base, say FP. And so. All right. <coughs> so here the perfectoid spaces are always analytic. Yes. Yes, they are always analytic. So actually, um, uh, so I want to give a very brief reminder about eddic spaces and perfectoid spaces next. Um, but maybe, well, let me start this before the break. Um, so. So as will be probably clear at this point is that uh, perfected space will be used a lot. Um, and well, I gave these six lectures here a while ago. And in some sense, I just assume that you have all been there. Uh, <coughs> but uh, let me nonetheless uh, try to recap a little bit. So. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> so uh, as with schemes, eddic spaces are associated with some kinds of rings, and these kinds of rings that I want to consider, are, I mean, I don't like this n n name so much, but anyway, uh, a Tate Huber ring. this way. Um, so there's a no general notion of a Huber ring, and a Huber ring can, ha can be Tate. It's some kind of adjective you can put to a Huber ring. Um, and I only want to consider, so there's a closely related notion, by the way, now of what's called an analytic Huber ring, which I think is a much better notion. Um, but it's also slightly more general, and I, I don't really need to extra generality, and it's easier to think about these guys which are actually Tate. And so for this reason, I want to stick to this. 
Um, <clears throat> and it's not always part of the definition, but let me just make it part of the definition because I will never consider non-complete guys. Um, so it's a complete topological ring A. Such that there exists some topologically important unit This is a state condition. Uh, such a guy is called a pseudo-uniformizer. Um, <coughs> and uh, an open suffering A0 of A containing pi. Uh, such that A0 has a pyadic topology. So, concretely, what does this mean? So, uh, so any such A is of the form, you take some ring B, you take its pi to completion, and you invert pi, where pi and B is a non-zero divisor. In which case we can take uh, A0 to be the pi completion of pi. And <coughs> one can show uh, that any, so such open sufferings A0, they're called rings of definition. And one can show that any two different rings of definition differ by a bounded power of pi. So, uh, And then maybe let me make two other definitions before the break. <coughs> A ring of integral elements is an open and integrally closed subring. Contained uh, in what's called a circ, which is a set of all power bonded elements. Which is a set of all X and A such that there exists some N such that. The set of all its powers is contained in pi to the minus n a zero. <coughs> the power bound means that the set of powers is bounded, and this boundedness condition in this case can be phrased pretty explicitly as saying that there is some n so that is contained in this pi to the minus n times a zero. And this is always a suffering, and 
So the role of this A plus is slightly tricky to uh, understand what it really means. Um, it becomes really important when one tries to study complex supported cohomologies, and it becomes really critical to always think about what the A plus is. <coughs> and so, Eddick spaces are associated with such pairs of uh, such a Tate Huber ring and a ring of integral elements A plus and A. And let me also uh, define perfectoid rings. Uh, so in this form, this definition is due to Fontaine. Uh, so it's supposed to be of this form, uh, such a Tate Hubering. <coughs> um, uh, uh, so such that there exists some uniformizer pi in A <coughs> such that the piece power divides P in A circ. So let's say throughout the course QP is fixed, some particular P is fixed. Um, in A circ. And the Frobenius is an isomorphism between A circ mod pi and A circ mod pi to the p. Can you A and, sorry, and A is what's called uniform, i.e. A circ is bounded. Uh, Right, so being uniform is a slight strengthening of the condition that uh, of being reduced. That's some kind of topological reducedness. Um, for most of, or for much of the course, it's actually enough to understand <coughs> what it means to be perfectoid of characteristic P. Uh, so this means that P is zero. And this turns out actually to be just the condition of being perfect. In addition to being a Tate Hooper ring. So there is a general argument that shows that if you're perfect, then you're actually automatically uniform. And then I learned this from Yves Andre. Um, right. Okay, so maybe it's time for a break now until, for 15 minutes, until 50? Yeah, yeah, let's say for 15 minutes until. All right, let's continue. Um, <coughs> so maybe let's just give some very brief examples. So there are some examples of non archimedean fields which have this property, say QP, a join of all P power roots of P, and then complete it where we can take for pi a piece root of p. Or you could do a similar thing in characteristic p. <coughs> or you could take algebras over those. But if you take an algebra over those, uh, you better join with any coordinate also all p power roots, because otherwise you will not ensure this condition that the Frobenius is so attractive there. Stuff like that. <coughs> and okay, let me also very briefly recall uh, the process of tilting. <coughs> if A is perfectoid, then one can define a new ring called the tilt of A, A flat. 
and as a topological monoid, topological multiplicative monoid, this is the inverse limit over the piece power map, which is now multiplicative but not additive. And then there's this funny formula for addition that x0, x1 plus y0, y1 gives you some new such sequence of elements which are compatible under the piece power map where zi is a certain periodic limit. The limit as n goes to infinity We first take further p power roots <coughs> and then raise to the p to the nth power again. And then this turns out to converge. <coughs> and this turns out to have the property that it always produces algebras which look kind of, it takes this completion and tilt you get this kind of similar algebra and characteristic P where T is the sequence of P power roots of P. <coughs> or if you do an algebra, like so, and tilt this, you get the similar Algebra and characteristic P. So A tilde is always of characteristic P. And if A is, is already of characteristic P, uh, tilting does nothing. So, yes. <coughs> and some kind of general intuition that will be in some sense justified by the theory of diamonds is that uh, tilting preserves all topological information like the underlying topological space or the etal side. But it forgets the structure morphism. Do I know spec ZP? <coughs> so of course, this A always has a unique map from ZP because P is topologically impotent. But now, if you pass the characteristic P, somehow in some you forget. In some sense, it's more vision. In some sense, that's precisely what you forget. <coughs> okay. And so, <coughs> now I need to talk about eddic spaces briefly. 
So let A be such a Tate Huber ring. And A plus an A, a ring of integral elements. <coughs> then the edX spectrum of this pair is defined to be uh, the set of all continuous variations are usually however written uh, as an absolute value sign from A to some totally ordered being group in, in zero, um, such that they are less or equal to one on the subring of integral elements up to an appropriate notion of equivalence. And so for any x and x, I write f maps to the absolute value of f at x for the corresponding variation. So <coughs> this edX spectrum is always what's called a spectral topological space. So spectral space, well, one stupid characterization of them is that it's one which is homeomorphic to the spectrum of some ring. <coughs> Another characterization is that it's, it's an inverse limit of finite T naught spaces and there are others. Um, they have some very good quasi compacity pro con constructibility properties. <coughs> so I have this long manuscript about the cohomology of diamonds, and in some sense, half of this manuscript is about the point set topology. It's about the point set topology of spectral spaces. So anyway. Um, uh, this is a spectral topological space for the topology uh, generated by rational subsets. So if these rational subsets uh, takes the role of the distinguished open subsets in the world of schemes, and they are <coughs> defined as follows. If you have uh, any elements generating the unit ideal, then you find a subset called U <coughs> where you invert G, uh, but you also insist that uh, certain inequalities are satisfied. So it's a set of all X and X. I said for all i, it's the absolute value of fi at x. So it knows the absolute value of g at x. Which in particular implies uh, that the absolute value of g at x must be non zero. Because if they generate the unit ideal, then they cannot all have absolute value zero. So one of them is non zero, but then also g is non zero. So indeed, G is non-zero. <coughs> G is non-zero on this subset. <coughs> but in fact, it's in some sense bounded below. OK. And 
So these are certain uh, they form a basis of quasi compact open. Open subsets, which are in fact stable under finite intersection. And in some characterizations of uh, spectral space, having such a basis uh, is part of the definition. And something's the hardest, well, I don't know, it's part of the definition. Um, okay, and so then <coughs> you can define a structure p chief <coughs> uh, so you set. Or X of U to be uh, what's written is you take A and then you join convergent power series in all these quotients of I over G. More precisely, this is defined as the pyadic completion. of the subalgebra generated by all these quotients inside of A inverse G. And then you invert pi again. And you check that this is independent of the choice of such an open subring A0 <coughs> and a pseudo uniformizer pi. <coughs> and it has a universal property. I will say this in a second. Okay, so I said it's all X of U, whereas so far this really depends on the elements F1 to F N of G. Uh, it will actually only depend on this open subset U in a second. <coughs> and you also define a certain subalgebra, or X plus of U. Uh, one way to say it is that it's a topological closure of the integral closure of A plus, and then you invert all these Fi over Gs. So this OX plus should always consist of functions which are bounded by one on the subset. And if I over G is such a function on the subset, <coughs> but also it's always supposed to be open and integrally closed, so you massage this a little bit to make it open and integrally closed. Okay, so the proposition that Oprah Gabba was referring to is the following is that, well, first of all, this is again <coughs> a Tate Huber ring. And OX plus of U is an ring of integral elements. Uh, and The map uh, from this edX spectrum to the edX spectrum of AA plus, <coughs> it factors over U and so recall that this was this X and U was this open subset in there. And uh, OX of U, OX plus of U is initial among A plus algebras with these properties.
In particular, this implies that indeed it depends only on you. <coughs> and in fact, it doesn't just factor over you, uh, but instead, it really, the adic spectrum is homeomorphic to you. Uh, and not just that, it's not just a homomorphism, but actually it also preserves rational subsets. <coughs> okay. right. Maybe I say it also the following lemma, that actually one can always recover this, this plus sheaf uh, from the OX, uh, oh, sorry, I should say something else first. Um, the fact that <coughs> any that you have this homeomorphism means that whenever you have a point of view, meaning a continuous valuation on an A, which happens to lie in U, U then <coughs> it automatically extends uniquely to a continuous valuation on OX of U, and so this implies right. So this implies that the Valuations uh, at x in fact extend to the stalk of this pre sheaf, the direct limit of our. <coughs> and now I can. Uh, states the lemma I wanted to state. You said. Ox plus of u is in fact the set of all f and u, or x of u, such that for all x and u, the absolute value of f at x is <coughs> <coughs> okay, and now everything would be really nice, except for this. There is this one problem that OX is not always a sheaf. This will not concern us very much because, in all cases that are relevant to us, for example, perfectoid spaces, this will be a sheaf. And <coughs> Actually, I don't know any natural example of a, sh of a pair AA plus where this is not a sheaf. So for anything that occurs in nature, things seem to be good, but... Uh. Hmm? Are there non-natural examples? There are non-natural examples, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so there is... Uh, you can find examples in the paper of Buzzard Werbeck moves. And uh, another paper of Mihara. <coughs> um, <coughs> okay, so you can make the following kind of definition that such a pair AA plus is sheafy. I'm not sure if this is a nice word, but uh, if OX is a sheaf. And there is a remark uh, due to Gabber, I think, that in fact this depends only on A. <coughs> and also, if it is a shift, then it is automatically a topological shift in the category of topological. Uh -huh, right. So, yeah, so it turns out that, I mean, you might think that. If you just ask it's a sheaf, you probably gain nothing because you just know it's a sheaf and then you can't really go on from there. But actually, the contrary is true. So as soon as you know this is a sheaf, you get a lot of other properties. Uh, so this was 
Uh, I, so me, for me, it was a surprise. Uh, so something proved by Kedlaya and Liu. Uh, if AA plus is Shifi, uh, many good properties follow. Uh, so yeah, it's a topological sheaf. Um, <coughs> you have that if you take the cohomology of the higher cohomology is zero for i bigger than zero. That's this acyclicity. Um, also, you can glue vector bundles, so there exists a good series of vector bundles. I mean, meaning that it's a category of finite projective A modules. It's equivalent to the category of finite locally free or X modules. Or locally finite free. Uh, what about coherent sheaves? Well, if your rings are very non Noetherian, of course you wouldn't expect a nice of coherent sheaves, because not even for schemes you have that. Um, you'd <coughs> on the other hand, because of some topological issues, you can't expect a good series of quasi coherent sheaves, even if everything is as Noetherian as you like. Um, <coughs> what Kedlai and Liu observed, however, is that you have a good series of so called pseudo coherent sheaves in general. Pseudo coherent meaning that you have this possibly infinite resolution by finite and free modules. And so all these good properties follow once you pass this first problem, which I find a bit surprising, but it's very nice. Okay? And so the series of vector bundles will actually be important to us. Okay, so uh, finally, I think I can give the definition. <coughs> so, in case you really get such or x as a sheaf, what you get is a topological space x equipped with a sheaf of complete topological rings O x. Um, and with a choice of continuous valuation on each stalk. And so this will be the kind of object that an attic space is. So and because I was only working with these guys which were Tate, uh, I only get what's called an analytic attic space. Um, so this is a locally topological ringed. Space X or X equipped with a choice of equivalence class of uh, continuous valuation. next uh, <coughs> it's such an object that is locally isomorphic to as 
some Spa AA Plus. For some AA Plus as above, which is Shifi. Continuous on OXX means continuous on OU for every... Uh, yes, conti I mean, you decrypt this with direct limit topologies, say. Direct limit in each sense. Ah, okay. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's equivalent to saying it's continuous when you restrict to X of U for any open subset U. Yeah, it's not clear that direct limit topologies are linked to the topology, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and a perfectoid space. Uh, is such an analytic attic space. <coughs> Covered by spa plus with a perfectoid. So there is a small question whether if SPA. Right, so it might be that you have an affinoid attic space, which is perfectoid as a space because it's covered by such guys, but it's not clear that this A itself is perfectoid. Uh, this is still not resolved. <coughs> Okay. Um. <coughs> okay. So, ten minutes left. So maybe I say a little bit about uh, tilting on spaces. So, So if A is perfectoid and A plus is a ring of integral elements, um, then <coughs> uh, A plus is a tilde of A flat is a tilde of A, and this also contains uh, automatically a plus ring corresponding to uh, A plus, which you define to be the similar inverse limit where you just take A plus. It actually turns out that rings of integral elements in a flat and in a are natural bijection under this correspondence. Um, uh, then you can relate the corresponding attic spectra. So, uh, <coughs> this maps homeomorphically to x flat. Why, uh, so if x maps to x flat, given by the rule that the absolute value of f at x tilt is <coughs> the absolute value of this f upper zero at x. So this is a homeomorphism preserving rational subsets. And <coughs> uh, for all rational subsets U, um, or X of U is again perfectoid. And if you tilt it, it's the same thing as a structure sheaf for the tilt evaluated, well, on the same subset U. Let me just call it U again. <coughs> uh, and 
so this tilting procedure uh, sheafifies somehow. <coughs> of all perfectoid spaces. And that's the category of perfectoid spaces of characteristic P. <coughs> and so something we will need to know is uh, <coughs> how the tall site works for perfectoid spaces. So to do this in the last minutes. Um, <coughs> um, okay, so one issue with defining this in some naive way, say using some finite presentation plus unique lifting property is that uh, there are no nilpotents in our perfect old algebras. Um, one could try to define some kind of very general notion of vital morphisms for all attic spaces and this might be possible um, and it might have a characterization of this form but let me just give a very concrete definition uh, of what an etal morphism is. Uh, okay, from x to y of perfecto spaces. And the first thing you define is a finite etal morphism. And the condition there is that if all perfectoid affinoid subsets are V, which are some spy SS plus in Y. Perfectoid affinoid meaning it's such an affinoid subset, but as Ofergawa pointed out, it's not in general known that this S will automatically perf be perfectoid in this case. So I asked that it is. Um, the pre-image <coughs> uh, inverse of V is again of this form. <coughs> and the map of algebras from S to R is finite et al in the algebraic sense. And uh, on the plus algebras, you just get the integral closure. <coughs> um, what you need to know about this definition is that this can be checked locally. which is not operatively clear because I asked it for all the phenoid perfectoid subspaces this happens. Uh, also, uh, if S is perfectoid and R over S is finite et al, then it's always true that R is again perfectoid. This is related to faulting this almost purity theorem. <coughs> Uh, on, on Y. I mean, it's enough to find a cover of Y by open, uh, finite perfectoids of this form where this happens. Um, 
And so, in fact, if you look at finite et al spaces over the eddic spectrum of some SS plus, then this is really equivalent to finite et al <laughs> S algebras. Uh, op, op, I guess. <coughs> So this notion really just locally reduces to the notion of a finite tall algebra over the ring. So here you use in particular the patching of vector, but this is one way to do it. You could use patching of vector models. I mean, I already proved this in my first paper where I didn't know this patching of modules. So then I reduced it to characteristic P and characteristic P, I used it, reduced it to the Syrian case. I guess it's easier if you just use the gluing for modules, yeah. <coughs> okay, so this is a notion of a finite detail morphism. Um, <coughs> and then there's a the notion of an etal morphism. If locally on X, it's of the form <coughs> as follows. So where this is an open immersion, this is an open immersion, and this map here is finite at all. So it's clear that any thing which is of this form should be considered et al. Uh, it's not clear that anything that should be considered et al admits such, such a description locally. And this is actually something that fails for schemes, but is true in this analytic world. Um, uh, So the usual counterexample is if you downstairs you have the A1 and upstairs you have some et al map which winds itself like this but you take out the two ramification points <coughs> and then if you have this point up here which maps to the same point as this ramification point then however small you try to go into a neighborhood of this point still if you try to compactify it into something finite et al you would still have to compactify over this point and it would not be et al. Um, but in, <coughs> in the analytic world, what you can do is you can just pass to some small open neighborhood of this point and make it finite at all. Okay, my time is up. Um, so let me just... Uh, State one last theorem. Uh, that if X is a perfectoid space, <coughs> let's call it X flat, then uh, under tilting. Uh, the finite et al and the et al sites are equivalent. <coughs> and I also need the following property that if x is. The site or the structure? Uh, the site. Uh, so uh, the categories are clear and the, and the coverings are just given by. Families of maps which are jointly surjective on the topological spaces. Mm. <coughs> and if X uh, is a phenoid, I also need the following property that if I look at the <coughs> 
a talk homology uh, there's an easier statement if I remove the plus here then it should be true in general that this should just be r in degree 0 and 0 in positive degrees but in this perfectoid situation you have something much better namely even on the integral level well it's still r plus if i is equal to 0 but it's almost 0 if i is bigger than 0 where almost 0 means that it's killed by all fractional powers uh, of epsilon uniformizer. <coughs> and this property will be critical in what follows. And so this kind of property that you have this almost vanishing here is actually something that, for example, doesn't hold true for general rigid spaces. So if you have the cusp, say, as a rigid space, then you could have unbounded torsion in the H1. <coughs> Okay. Um. Right. So next time I will introduce uh, proital maps of perfectoid spaces, and then I can define diamonds and so on and so forth. <coughs>